Gray Brecken, the founder and project scholar of the Living New Deal, which is based at the UC Berkeley Department of Geography. This nationwide project is rediscovering the vast public works legacy of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, as well as the lost ethical language that propelled it. He is the author of Imperial San Francisco, Urban Power, Earthly Ruin, which was partly inspired by a 1985 winter sojourn in Venice, so a lovely link to Emma's paper, and his 1976 master's thesis in art history on Ruskin's Stones of Venice. Brecken is a companion of the Guild of St. George, for which he delivered the 2014 Ruskin Lecture in Sheffield in England on the influence of Ruskin's thought upon the New Deal via the Settlement House movement in both Britain and the US. This current talk is an elaboration of that presentation. He has lately been investigating the revival of the arts and crafts movement in the US national and state parks during the Great Depression via Berkeley trained or Berkeley trained architect Herbert Mayer. And so I am pleased mm -hmm. to introduce Gray on Necessitous Men Are Not Free Men, Ruskin, The New Deal, and the Settlement House Movement. Good to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about the Living New Deal as much as I'd like to, so I put some things down here so that you can pick them up afterwards on the stage. Um, so, um, yeah, I gave this talk, um, as Rachel said, in 2014, at which point I wasn't really quite sure if I believed my own thesis. I do by now, actually. I've done a fair amount of research since then, so this is an elaboration of that. Um, I wanted to start with a, a passage from E.M. Forster's Howard's End, which, of course, was made into a movie by um, Ivory Merchant. And um, this is Leonard Bast, trying to read Ruskin. Thoughts are going through my head. You laugh. You're listening, then. Not only accident, but it'll get wet in the rain. Did you? No. You said you lost your umbrella. Oh, thank Lord. Look how it's cold. It'll go to his chest. And where's the money to come from for the doctor? And what if he is in the hospital? And they take him to the hospital in the ambulance. And in with holes in his socks. I want to see. What? Well, as you can see, this goes on for quite some time. As you can see, uh, Helena Bonham Carter's um, plandishments are absolutely no match for the Stones of Venice. <laughs> and for me, reading um, The Nature of the Gothic has the same effect every time I do it. It just totally kills lust. Um, <laughs> So I recommend that you see it. But the, the whole point of this is that, um, uh, as, as uh, Forster says in that passage, um, the rich man is talking to us from his gondola. Uh, it's his way of saying that for somebody of Leonard Bast's station in life, um, this is totally irrelevant, um, what this rich man in his gondola has to say to him, because this man... Leonard, uh, can barely afford to leave London, let alone to go to the continent or go to Venice and sit in a gondola contemplating the Gothic arches. Um, and so, um, and of course, Leonard's uh, station in life is about to become much worse, thanks to the well-intended um, interventions of the Schlegel sisters. Um, so I want to talk to somebody else who grew up in a very different circumstance, um, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, she was born in 1884 to a very wealthy Hudson River family. She was related to everybody, including her distant cousin Franklin, whom you were about to see. Um, she had a miserable childhood. Uh, it was struck with all kinds of tragedy. Um, this is the house she actually grew up in called Oaklawn. 
um, near the village of Tivoli. It has a wonderful view out onto the Catskills, and it's being restored right now by a great admirer of uh, Eleanor, so I'm anxious to go back and see it. Um, meanwhile, down the Hudson um, were, were, as I said, her distant cousin, Franklin. Um, now, Franklin had a very different kind of upbringing. Um, he came from a similarly wealthy family, a landed gentry, um, and he was brought up as a young princeling. Um, I was think I've been thinking all, all day as I listened to um, Ruskin how similar in some ways um, his upbringing was to uh, Roosevelt's. He was an only child, and he was cosseted. Um, I think his upbringing was actually much happier than was Ruskin's, and here he is sitting with his very older father who died early in his life, and then his life was largely dominated by his own mother right into the time that he was in the White House. Um, but he was a princeling. Um, he was tall, handsome, good-looking, um, and so uh, here we are um, with Eleanor, who was sent by her grandmother uh, from Oaklawn over to a finishing school for wealthy um, young heiresses over in Wimbledon near London, and let's see, there she is right there. She's the tall one. Uh, she was about over six feet tall, and um, this was a turning point in her life um, because it was at Allenswood that she fell under the influence of Marie Souvestre, um, and this was a remarkable, liberal, beautiful, lesbian woman, um, intellectually very, very acute, and she recognized in this young American era something quite out of the ordinary. And she became her favorite student. They traveled together on the continent. Um, and um, But Suvest was also a good friend of Mary Humphrey Ward, the best-selling woman's novelist in Britain at that time. She was born Mary Arnold in Tasmania, grew up there, and then um, migrated with her family back to the motherland. And uh, she was the niece of Matthew Arnold and the granddaughter of the reformer of um, rugby, the school there. So she's in a very rich intellectual milieu. She's well-to-do. She marries well. And um, she was, came under the influence. She was a very dedicated Christian. And she comes, um, well, I shouldn't say under the influence. Uh, she um, was very influenced herself by Toynbee Hall, the first of the settlement houses. This is in the East End, established by the Barnetts. Um, and it was highly influenced by Ruskin's thinking. Um, and so, I think, was uh, Mary Ward. Um, she lived at 61 um, Russell Square um, in Bloomsbury, in the heart of Bloomsbury. Uh, this is it. And she had a neighbor that she's going to become very entangled with. That is John Passmore Edwards. He was a um, Cornishman um, who came to London and was a self-made man, made a fortune in publishing, and then gave most of it away. He was sometimes known as the Cornish Carnegie. Um, it's too bad that he's so little known now because he actually was an irascible but very good man and very advanced in his thinking. And he wrote a little autobiography and this is what he had to say in it. Um, he was influenced by a number of people. He read voraciously, but this famous quote by Ruskin was one of the things that he singled out as one of his motivating influences in life. Now, he gave over 70 buildings away in Cornwall and in London to better the lives of working men. People like Leonard Bast, as a matter of fact. They're generally in a kind of high Victorian style. You see them all over. This is in Shepherd's Bush, a library in Shepherd's Bush. Um, this is in Whitechapel. Um, it's a library and an art gallery. He gave settlement houses, he gave hospitals, especially for epileptics and various others. Um, he was a remarkably philanthropic man, and his goal was to better the lives of working men because he himself had come from the working class. Now, uh, Mary Ward um, persuaded him to give 4,000 pounds for a settlement house. Um, she had started another one over in Gordon Square, and then she wanted to build a somewhat larger one 
um, on Tavistock Place, which is in the heart of Bloomsbury. And this is the very unusual design. It looks like it was designed by Voise, um, but um, this was the architect's drawing. This is the way that it looks. Um, I love this building. Um, I always try to walk past it every time I'm in London. Uh, it has such a clean uh, look to it. And this was the John Passmore Edwards um, settlement house in the heart of Bloomsbury. Um, now, uh, his, she kept wheedling uh, Edwards until finally he gave four times his initial offer, 16, um, yeah, it was about um, 16,000 uh, pounds for this building and various um, appurtenances to it. This is the inside of the building. It's quite beautiful. And this is the, the doorway. Uh, it subsequently was renamed the Mary Ward House. And it was only recently that I had the courage to walk around to the side. And there's a big sort of um, overhang there. And underneath it, looking somewhat like the introduction to Star Wars, is this text. The idea of the settlement, a settlement is a colony of members of the upper classes formed in a poor neighborhood with the double purpose of getting to know the local conditions of life from personal observation and of helping wherever it is needed. The settler gives up the comfort of a West End home and becomes a friend of the poor. So this is very different than just giving money. You go and you live with the poor. You not only lift them up, so that they can get some of the advantages that you have had, but you also learn from them. So it gets away from the idea of condescension or patronization of the poor. You actually learn what causes the problems that they suffer. Now, I had an opportunity to spend a week at the London Metropolitan Archives going through the Mary Ward papers, and there's a lot of photographs there as well as textual material, and I'm going to show it to you because what struck me as I looked at it was the similarities with the New Deal. The costumes change, but the activities are the same. So this is a discussion group, um, um, and it's co-ed um, at the Mary Ward House. And they, the Settlement House movement, just to repeat, was influenced by the ideas of John Ruskin. And it was largely the product, both in Britain and in the United States, of remarkable women to a large extent. There were men involved, but remarkable women. Um, Marie Souvest, Mary Ward, Jane Addams at Hull House in Chicago, um, Lillian Wald at the Henry Street Settlement on the Lower East Side. You'll come, we'll come back to that. Uh, Frances Perkins, the first Secretary of Labor, and of course, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, well, this is the University Settlement on the Lower East Side, and after Eleanor was called back by her grandmother from um, uh, Allen's Wood. She didn't want to go because she was having such a great time there. Uh, she didn't want to go and become a debutante, but she went back. But almost immediately she goes to work in a settlement house, this one on the Lower East Side. And um, it's still going strong there. Um, this is what Rivington Street, which is what it's on, looked like at that time. Not the kind of place that she had grown up with or the, the Roosevelt Townhouse, one of many in New York City, it's got back alleys like this. And she says in her autobiography that uh, walking to it terrified her. Unlike her friends in the upper classes, she did not go to the university settlement in her private carriage. She took public transit and walked there. And she said it terrified her, but she also just learned so much by doing so. Now, this is a picture of her late in life carrying her own suitcase. We don't have any photographs of her earlier, but it. Uh, Eleanor, as you will see, was not a snob. Um, she, as I said, learned from the, those people that she set out to help. Now, um, about the same time, she began courting, or she was being courted by her distant cousin from down the river, Franklin, and it, in fact, uh, here they are on their, their um, honeymoon um, in Venice. Um, she's probably reading Ruskin there, or maybe a Baedeker. <laughs> and trying to learn. She was always very, very curious. And here's Franklin. And I like this photograph of him because he was tall and handsome and a budding politician. And he was a little bit haughty, actually, <laughs> until 1921, when this happened. He came down with polio at Campobello 
and you probably know the story. Um, he was an adult at that time, and it, um, he thought that it had ended his political career and much else. He plunged into a very deep depression. Eleanor, his wife, um, they had had six children by that time, five of whom survived. Um, she um, nursed him, and it was a terrible period in his life. But I think in many ways it made him, because it taught him compassion. I think with Eleanor it was natural. Uh, Franklin had to learn it. This is one of only two known photographs of, of Franklin in a wheelchair. Um, all others were suppressed, because he knew that he couldn't inspire Americans if they knew how really disabled he was. It's part of his heroism, I think. Um, but he, did, he was head of the March of Dimes, and it's largely because of his leadership, in fact, that um, we were able to get the Salk and the Sabin vaccines, which is why people of my generation and on don't have to worry about polio. Um, he did very, a great deal to help people, other people stricken with it. On March 4th, 1933, he was inaugurated. Um, Eleanor made a remarkable couple. Um, we really got a twofer during the, um, the Great Depression because as disabled as he was, he would send Eleanor out, and it seems like she was constantly traveling and bringing back information to him and suggestions or commands about what Franklin must do. He used the radio um, to communicate himself. That was Twitter at the time, and uh, except that he could speak English. Um, and um, <laughs> he explained to people um, what he was doing and why he was doing it, and they loved him for it. Of course, he had this buoyant personality. And of course, the first thing he says in his first inaugural is, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Quite different, isn't it? Um, and he, he and Eleanor uh, gathered around themselves a remarkable crew of character, almost all of whom had worked in the settlement house movement. These were honest, brave, ingenious people, and most of all, Eleanor, of course. And perhaps the greatest of them all, well, no, there's, it really he's challenged by several, especially Francis Perkins, is Harry Hopkins, who had worked in the Christodora Settlement House, but he knew all the others. He was from Grinnell, Iowa. He grew up in the social gospel movement, but also in the Settlement House movement, and he would become head of the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Again, he was another person that never slept. Okay, so here's settlement um, work and works progress. You can see the influence of arts and crafts there. Um, I, this is from the Henry Street settlement on the Lower East Side, which was headed by Lillian Wald. Uh, they've just mounted a wonderful museum there, and I've got several things from this. Um, and you can see that the settlement house um, workers actually knew that the pathologies that we experience and they experience were at the root of it was ignorance and poverty, and they had to address it at the root. So here were some of the things that they did in the settlement houses, and I'm going to contrast this or compare it with the WPA. As I say, the, the, the um, clothes change, but the activities are the same. Vocational training. This is WPA vocational training. Domestic economy, as they called it at that time. This is teaching nursing, Dancing, that's what uh, Fran um, Eleanor taught at the um, university settlement. Folk dancing. Um, sports, athletics were extremely important. WPA, fencing. Discussion, often of workers' rights. This is the WPA class. Music, very important. WPA. WPA. Kindergarten's extremely important. Um, WPA. Multiracial. Arts and crafts. They were very concerned with bringing up healthy um, healthy, happy children. And of course, you. so this is the emphasis on, on kindergartens, on hot lunches. They knew the children that are hungry are going to be stunted for the rest of their life. 
It goes without saying that they couldn't have imagined a country that separates children from their families and locks them in concentration camps and denies them toothbrushes and vaccinations. This would have been inconceivable to them. It's inconceivable to me. Um, more art classes. This is in Florida. And crippled children's schools. The, um, Mary Ward set up the first one in Britain, perhaps the first one of all, next to the settlement house. And this is um, art classes, WPA art classes for children in San Francisco. They set up, um, they built um, orthopedic schools around the country. Uh, the New Deal did, and they are beautiful. This one in San Francisco, uh, of it, they said, we made this building as beautiful as possible to take the children's minds off their misfortunes. And they had hydrotherapy pools, which Roosevelt very much believed in from his experience at Warm Springs, Georgia. Um, outdoor recreation was extremely important. Here is Mar um, Mary Ward herself with children uh, out on an excursion to the country, a WPA summer camp. Um, this is a, a statement from Franklin Roosevelt's um, second, um, second inaugural address at the Roosevelt Memorial in um, Washington, D.C. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Well, that is a fundamentally Christian statement. And the point I always make is that the Roosevelts were practicing rather than professing Christians. Um, they walked the walk. Um, we know that Eleanor read Ruskin. Uh, she read Sesame and Lilies um, as a young girl, and she wanted Franklin to read it too. This is a copy I found with copyright 1935, uh, which she gave, apparently gave to Franklin while he was president. And in the back of it, I found in what is apparently his handwriting, practical Christianity only of value. So uh, he probably read this when he was president. Okay, the New Deal was a comprehensive moral vision. And these were some of the things that came with it. And for those of you who are steeped in Ruskin, all of this will seem very familiar. We got Social Security from Frances Perkins. There she is. The very purpose of government is to give people the best possible life. Now, she wrote this memoir, The Roosevelt I Knew, and she said that the word that he, Franklin used most often um, was decency, that everybody should be entitled to a decent standard of living. We, not this. This is what we've come to take for granted. And I have a little essay here called Choosing and Decency, which I wrote for the Living New Deal newsletter. Um, so I, I welcome you to pick that up. Uh, just to wrap up, Again, some of these similarities with Ruskin, crafts and self-sufficiency, very important for Eleanor Roosevelt and the people that she gathered around herself. Um, she established with this lesbian couple on the Roosevelt family property um, an arts and crafts um, uh, cooperative called Valkyl Industries. This is the stone house that Franklin Roosevelt built for them, designed it himself, and it's very much, there it is on the outside, when you go into the inside, it's very much an arts and crafts house. It has a loom there. Uh, here's Eleanor making some stuff herself. This is her bedroom with all Valkyl furniture, probably some of which she made. Um, the WPA itself um, commissioned, uh, promoted arts and crafts. Oh, that was Harry Hopkins, by the way. And um, the arts were an absolutely essential part of the settlement house movement. It had to be integrated into life. And so here are some of the crafts sponsored by WPA. You can see the range of it. Lithography, for example. Um, wood carving. Loom uh, weaving. And then there was a whole series of photographs I found in the National Archives of hands. And this actually was studies for a, it's about a six minute silent movie just called Hands, which we posted online on the Living New Deal site. And it just shows what you can do and should do with hands when they are occupied. Um, because it begins with hands that are unoccupied and then it shifts to hands that are occupied and how that gets an economy going. But more important, it's about, all about self-sufficiency and self-respect.
I love this one because it's old hands together, black and white. Stained glass. And Braille. Well, this is a WPA poster for crafts at the Henry Street Settlement. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of settlement houses went out of business is because the WPA took over so much of what they did. But it employed millions of people to alleviate poverty and all the problems that come along with it using these Ruskinian principles. And so what was there in the need for settlement houses? It's amazing any of them, such as Henry Street, survived, but some have. Um, but um, during the Great Depression, it actually took up the task of the settlement house movements. Uh, for example, this is a crafts at Henry Street. Eleanor spread this advocacy through her column, her daily column called My Day. She was a working journalist, and um, so it's fascinating to read through her columns, which are all online now. Um, and uh, she advocated these things. This is her teaching at a progressive school that she ran um, in Greenwich Village. Um, here she is serving food to the poor. Uh, here she is visiting a, a black school. Here she is visiting miners down in an anthracite mine in, in Pennsylvania. But she could also put on the swank, too, with world leaders at the same time. She was an absolutely remarkably versatile, non-snobbish person. And finally, the importance of integrating arts into life. That was a WPA poster. Um, it wasn't just visual arts, it was all of the arts were, were sponsored by the WPA in uh, a five-part division, uh, which was part of the WPA. Visual arts, music, theater under Hallie Flanagan, um, writing, and records. They preserved a great deal of records. And probably the most, um, uh, the most visual or memorable um, uh, legacy of that is the post office murals, which you'll see all over the United States. It's a continent-spanning art gallery of American art. This is the Rincon Annex post office in San Francisco. There's a great story behind that, but there's no time. And finally, um, conservation and nature therapy. This is the Franklin Roosevelt family home. It's now a national historic uh, landmark. The Roosevelt Library is there. He gave it to the country at the, towards the end. And uh, it's a beautiful piece of property on which he planted a half million trees. Once asked to describe himself, he said, I am a grower of trees. And this is one of the paths through the forest there. And it was his idea to, do the civilian, to create the Civilian Conservation Corps to put young unemployed men to work. It employed three and a half million young men. And they did everything. There were 4,000 camps of 200 men each around the country. They took care of our forests, and every camp had educational facilities, including art. Um, they had libraries. They had correspondence classes. And little known is that they were integrated 14 years before the armed forces were outside of the South. And they gave us these beautiful arts and crafts buildings in our national parks. This is in Big Basin. Finally, I'm saying that too much. Um, in 1941, um, Franklin Roosevelt, in his State of the Union address, in, um, enunciated what he called the four freedoms. The, the first two, um, of expression and of religion, are in the United States Constitution, to which he said it should be added freedom from want and freedom from fear. Both of those, of course, are intimately connected. If you um, have want, you have fear. In our day, certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. The right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living. 
the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, the right to a good education. Does that sound familiar? That is Roosevelt's last State of the Union address, and he died 14, year, 14 months later. So none of that, of course, was implemented. This is how it winds up. All of these rights spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. So this economic bill of rights was considered, he considered it absolutely essential, not just for, for creating peace, but for, um, and it shouldn't just be in the United States, it should be everywhere. It was a new deal for the world. He stressed that. And he also says in that speech, necessitous men are not free men. That's where the title came from. And that's the point that I wanted to wind up in. Um, Leonard, of course, is not a free man. He just simply doesn't have the means for it. Today, only those who can afford to buy it have real freedom, um, as you can see by those who have private jets, where they apparently expect to escape climate change. Um, all right, he died in 45, uh, very suddenly, um, Eleanor Roosevelt said at the time, the story is over. It wasn't for her, and it wasn't for us. She lived on until 1962. She became known as the first lady of the world. And here she is at the United Nations, President Truman. She was so respected that he made her the first um, uh, woman delegate to the United Nations. And here she is overseeing what became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which embodies that second Bill of Rights and the Four Freedoms. It's a remarkable document, the preamble of which actually was written by the president of Barnard College, Virginia Gildersleeve, who's been largely forgotten. All right, well, um, I just wanted to show you what I think are the many connections. Uh, Stuart Eagles has written a wonderful book about how Ruskin uh, his, his advocacy um, was so pervasive that many people um, were influenced without ever reading it. In this case, I think both Eleanor and Franklin did read it, but I'm sure that it came to them through other more subterranean streams, as it has to so many other people. So thank you so much for sticking with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.